just a brief introduction of the webinar. Uh, in this webinar titled 50 Years of the Dalit Panthers, Its Contexts and Consequences, we plan to discuss the social, political, literary and historical context and consequences of the Dalit Panthers. This webinar will be an attempt to chart out and discuss the emancipatory and reflective horizons of the broader movement in ideas which accompanied the formation of a political organization like the Dalit Panthers, which was by no means limited to Maharashtra, where it was founded, but extended to regions like Northern and Southern India as well. I would now like to introduce you all to our stellar set of panelists. Um, Udhav Kamble, who is a retired IPS officer and renowned Marathi author. Nirmala Jadav, who teaches in Tarabai Shindi, uh, Tarabai Shinde Center for Women's Studies at Baba Sahib Ambedkar Marathawad University, Aurangabad. Uh, Partha Sarthi Muthu Karupan, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Cultural Studies at English and Foreign Language University. Uh, Soumya Shailendra, who is a PhD student in Comparative Literary Studies at Wienberg College of Arts and Sciences. Hugo Gorringe, Senior Lecturer, Sociology and Co-Director, Center of Asian South Asian Studies, University of Edinburgh. And Professor Gopal Guru, who is the editor of EPW and who will be the discussant for the evening. Um, now I'll just hand over to Ankit, who will be the moderator for this session. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Divya. And uh, hello uh, and welcome once again uh, to everyone who have joined um, this webinar uh, this evening. So just some um, elementary ground rules before I officially, I mean, before we officially start. So our speakers will be speaking for about uh, 10 to 12 minutes. And uh, after that, we'll have uh, Professor Guru offer some of his um, reflective comments upon um, the, the, the all the presentations made today. And uh, then uh, we will have the question answer session. Um, uh, everyone in the audience is requested to put um, their questions and comments in the chat box. And I will uh, take them up uh, as the discussion proceeds and we'll you know, discuss them uh, in the Q&A uh, session later. So um, yes, before, before any further uh, ado, I'd like to, um, I'd like to ask uh, Uddha Kamre sir uh, to uh, offer his presentations on the theme of 50 years of Dalit Panthers. Yeah. Ankit, uh, Ankit, Ankit, just, Ankit yeah. just a minute. You just would you please announce the order of the panelists you now? Yes, sir. Just the order of the panelists has been as uh, for the introduction. So first, um, Uddha Kamre sir will be speaking. Then uh, Nirmala Jadhav. Then uh, Parthasarthi Mutukarupan. Then Soumya Shailendra, and then Hugo Goranj. So that's the order. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you hear me, everybody? Every, good evening, everybody. Can you yes. hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, um, thank you very much for inviting me for this webinar. Um, before uh, discussing the Dalit Panthers of, of speciality and work, we have to see the uh, Panthers' inspirational background before going into the details. First, I will give two, three points. One, um, uh, four point background, uh, inspirational backgrounds I will give. Number one is Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar's social movements fighting provided the self-confidence and self-respect uh, and uh, for the Dalits and courage to fight for the justice and uh, right particularly the Dalit youth, number one. Number two, as suggested in your keynote, late 60s and early 70s, there were powerful radical movements worldwide. Among them, number one, is the civil rights movement in America, uh, during which the Black Panther was formed in 1966. Second, uh, in France, May 68, uh, there was a youth and students uprising supported by the workers and trade unions were trade unions at again there is a, students at youth movement all over the world and uh, during early 70s the universities and colleges were in the hotbed all these movements uh, may not have been, uh, may not have, may be revolutionary, but they were uh, loaded and fired with radicalism. 
and radicalism was in the air. Fourth, in local level, uh, the un unemployment and rising atrocities on Dalits, all these factors provided the inspiration and background for the emergence of uh, Dalit Panther. We have to keep this point in mind. Dalit Panther emerged, uh, was formed in May 7, 1972. It was a, uh, these four factors we discussed, they may not be directly uh, correlated to formation of Dalit Panther, but they provided the inspiration and motivation. The Dalit Panther's objective uh broad broadly they were egalitarian anti-casteism and anti-capitalist panthers the slogan was i put it in marathi bol dalita halla bol bol shramika halla bol zati vadyavar halla bol bhandwal shayur halla bol this was the uh, broad and against capitalism against casteism and it was clearly reflected in Dalit Panther's manifesto published in 1973, which says it was against feudalism, against imperialism, and it will be uh, against the exploitative broad collective to fight with revolutionary dream. These, uh, with these objectives, Dalit Panther was formed, and it's, but it was very aggressive and assertive in nature it provided the hopes and confidence to the Dalit youth. It was a uh, Dalit Panther has a widespread effect and impact. And it was a powerful, uh, not only in Maharashtra, but in other states also as suggested, other states of India. On the background of this uh, docile and compromised Republican leadership, this aggressiveness, assertiveness of the Panther was totally new. and it provided, created a hope and aspiration in the minds of the Dalit, particularly the Dalit youth. Powerful groups, powerful people and po political parties started listening to the Dalit Panther and uh, gave respect whatever they, are cogniz they took cognizance of taken. For this uh, Dalit Panther, they use various means at their disposal, particularly uh, the organization they form at various levels, organizational level, well attended and spirited public meetings, literature, uh, literary, various literary forms, particularly the poetry, pamphleteering, and uh, a powerful language. With these means and resources, Dalit Panther uh, created an impact which was uh, seen, listened, and heard all over the Maharashtra and beyond Maharashtra. Uh, but it seems uh, this power uh, organization in, in the year itself, uh, after two years of its formation, differences between its leadership started cropping up. Particularly after the defeat of Congress candidate, M Mumbai parliamentary elections, Ramrawadi, uh, Congress was desperate and bent upon to undermine uh, Dalit Panthers. And Mah then, 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 then Maharashtra Chief Minister Vasantra Naik used Balasaheb Thakre and his Sivsena for this purpose. And Balasaheb Thakre was a willing partner to do this. Successive, also, successive Chief Ministers and established leadership has done this with using various means. It was said that. Dalit Panther split, Dalit Panther divided because of ideological differences between Raja Dhale, Namdev Dasar, on Buddhism and versus communism. Dasar represent, Dhale representing Buddhism and Dasar or communism. But this was not correct. This was a self glorification. The real reason for the split and division of the Dalit Panther was the clash of personalities and immaturity on the part of its leadership. One of the leaders of the uh, Panther, uh, J.V. Pawar, has confirmed this. It was a family a personality clash. And uh, he has written in the Anis magazine, it was a cast of personality. Leaders took weird and illogical stands. Namdev Dasar supported the emergency where there was all these things. There was no cohesion and no 
comradeship with the result of all these this dalit panther was dissolved in 1976 after the emergency the new factions after this new faction emerged uh, bharatiya dalit panther was headed uh, under the leadership of arun kamble now considering all these things the major was many people ask was it successful or what is the failure it, it depends on how look you look at the success and failure we we can see politics we can view politics in two ways politics for the power and politics for the justice if we judge dalit panther uh, on the criteria of politics for power you may say that it has uh, not achieved its goal but if you say the organization for justice i feel it gave a self respect and self confidence and it was uh, a successful organization this is what i feel from my point of view two major drawbacks uh, two major shortcomings comings were there in uh, this organization number one it was uh, ideological reason not properly in curtail ideological commitment it was not properly worked quite it at this embryonic stage and it seems it was emotional sporadic and outburst they said they were fighting out casteism capitalism brahminism but uh, with resources but what resources what strategy and means it was not clear and it going to how to going how they were going to do this at organization level i feel it was a loose setup without proper networking without proper chain of command and local units leaders and workers started working acting on their own ways accordingly to their own interest and your understanding it was a good start uh, the organization gave it was a very powerful uh, impact they created but uh, this opportunity was lost um, because of their dissolve and after that the dalit politics and dalit uh, organization are in total disarray when that again opportunity will come it is a opportunity lost when that opportunity come uh, it is anybody's guess thank you very much thank you thank you so much uh, uddhav kamde sir for uh, so um, thoughtfully you know providing the whole formative context of the dalit panthers while at the same time giving us a glimpse of some of its uh, shortcomings um i mean uh, it's also perhaps uh, um optimistic that you know uh, you ended on a, on a slightly positive and hopeful note um so yeah now i'd like to uh, invite uh, dr nirmala jadhav uh, ma'am please uh, you can provide your uh, comments now uh thank you ankit and thank and thank you epw on all and the team for uh, really inviting me as a panelist for this uh, significant webinar on the 50 years of dalit panthers uh, its context and uh, consequences uh, actually really i am not the uh, expert on this issue but really when i got the mail i felt that it's a, a, a great opportunity for me to really uh, think over it and get an opportunity to really uh, explore this um, uh dalit panthers it's really i feel uh, a glorious history of modern uh, 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 history of uh, maharashtra not just maharashtra but in india uh, because uh, uh, the con the consequences or the shortcomings or the plus points really uh, talked in very detail by earlier speaker but uh, when i was uh, reading and thinking about this dalit panthers moment and its uh, history uh, i uh, they are really felt that uh, we read history and understand history really not just for the sake of history but really to may, uh, make better uh, present and the future so really how do i look at the red panthers uh, in present situation that mattered me uh, more so i feel that this uh, the co contribution of dalit panthers or the, this 50 years of dalit panthers which really uh, uh, enlightens us i feel is that the uh the methodological really part i feel very significant because uh 
uh, as earlier speaker sir udogamre sir said that really this we all were the youths we without really uh, less of the resources and they really established this whole uh, uh, radical movement and they were fighting for the restoration of the constitutional rights of the dalits and all the oppressed class and they were just not uh, fighting but they were also very logically uh, uh, very radically asking the questions to the government to the power agencies and also the the oppressive structures like caste system the religion and all this so i feel it's very significant we should understand that that uh, that fighting spirit and the uh, quest critical questioning to these uh, systems should be uh, taken into consideration that really a, it may be any period but that fighting uh, spirit and the uh, critical questioning uh, is very uh, significant so i really feel this is the um, uh, significant contribution of dalit panthers uh, to uh, all time uh, moments and also uh, uh, as i'm a women studies uh, student i feel when i look at it from feminist perspective uh, if i become very critical then so many drawbacks i uh, i may find in it but somewhere i feel that in the 70s when really the feminist women's movement has also not started so really to expect all those things from dalit panther it would be too uh, injusticeable to it but still when we study the history of dalit panthers uh, it can be seen that women's issues or the violence against women the atrocities against women where somewhere the real central issues of the red panthers they really fight for that the to uh, dignity of the uh, women and the the article by raja dhale on this uh, uh, tricolor and the women's uh, <laughs> dignity is very significant which really puts for the logic of reasoning where he is comparing where do you how do you look at the respect the, uh, of women and or the, the the cloth of peace so i feel that reasoning is very important are you and the 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 poems by namdev dasar all this uh, they are really uh, uh, very empathetic about uh, women's issues but somewhere i feel that uh, this uh, looking at women is somewhere from uh, uh, a protective mode or somewhere they are also looked in as the the uh, um, uh, the uh, symbols of caste and uh, not uh, the really uh, a structural understanding of the women's issue really lacking in it the participation of women is also very uh, less it can be very seen but still the all it is in its context it's, uh, we can't expect everything to, to be there but those flaws are also there when we really read uh, the histories written by jv power or the other uh, writers there we, uh, we feel that this uh, patriarchal dominance is still uh, there and that need to be uh, understood critically uh, analyzed also and that has not uh, gone nowadays also many dalit feminist or the feminist the thinkers are uh, talking about this but it's the, there but i feel it's very uh, significant that this uh, whole concern or the the, uh, the the women's issue was the central point in this whole uh, radical movement of dalit panthers and another point which i really uh, uh like or the appreciate about this dalit panthers history or the movement which really uh, not just more than 5 years it's it's i feel it's a very uh, very uh, less period uh, to uh, judge a movement actually this nothing 5 years history but uh, the only this 5 years were so uh, in a way very uh, significant uh, they made an imprint on the history that we there it's being uh, read and discussed and uh, thought over so this uh, time doesn't matter but how they really fight back was the main contribution of theirs so in this uh, five years uh, in the decades of 60s and uh, late 60s and early 70s i feel to uh, start a movement like this the lip panthers or any movement uh, in comparison to today's time when we are living in the, the 2020s i feel it's too difficult because the all those this uh, panthers in a way are not very resourceful people there are uh, not uh, uh, um, money is lacking all these uh, educated young youths are there 
uh, no like today's xerox or the the flex banners or the, the uh, transport communications telephones uh, now we have the social media now means uh, we have all the really ease to run a movement or an organization but we do not we are lacking that fighting spirit that reasoning that criticality so we now can and we are we may criticize and we may, we may debate but really how difficult it's to uh, start a uh, like an in, in, uh, organization uh, in today's period not possible but these uh, all the dalit panther youths were in all those adversities uh, they were fighting uh, back because uh, they had that spirit so i uh, i really uh, appreciate uh, that um, uh, spirit again which really makes us to think about this the dalit panther and their contribution uh, again and again uh, and now uh, uh, while uh, de debating about this uh, uh, uh period of uh, 60s and 70s i feel that uh, so, somewhere to in, in comparison to today's time uh there now we have all the ease of transport communication money and all those things but now when really we are living in 21st century but the constitutional uh agencies the power structures are really becoming uh, so oppressive in a way we can say but at that time when i was reading the writings of javi power and the history of the dalit panther setting uh, how significant role was was played by the newspapers like the uh, the newspapers were full of the stories or the news of the atrocities against the dalit, dalit women and really this uh, news or these uh, reportings of these uh, uh, incidences of violence really made somewhere these youths to to fight uh, uh, against uh, all these uh, operations so um, i uh, really feel that a uh, in a way somewhere is it it's a uh, it's a can we say the glory of democracy can be seen there that the opposition uh, there there is a ruling party with full uh, majority uh, the um, still it's not uh, really uh, they can say uh, behaving in this uh, uh, shutting down all these voices raising against uh, them so that respect was there even uh, where uh, we can hear from uh, Namdev Dasal's narratives that that the Indira Gandhi at that time he she gave the, the one and a half hour to him, and also that respect was there. The the minister used to talk. So I feel somewhere this very healthy uh, democratic uh, fighting environment was there. Nowadays with that majority is also there, but that majority is so in a way uh, I can that power is uh, so uh, fearful that it's already uh, we can uh, we can uh, 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 see that the newspapers the electronic media the new channels they are they are not at all worried about the issues of the people they have they have just uh, in a way become the purpose uh, doing the propaganda of the government uh, policies and the government uh, ideologies so that i feel that context should be discussed uh, really because it's, I, it's, I feel that beauty of the time is in the uh, the running of the democracy it's very sad that on the uh, on one side we have this uh, huge atrocities against dalits that um, uh, uh, the the burial uh, report we can say that how many incidences were taking place the uh, uh, uh the brahman dalit bauda case the brahman gao case all this there but still this dalit panthers movement could become possible uh in that environment so there is a huge contribution of newspapers journals uh on all these uh, the, uh writers uh, they were also taking somewhere stand so even the youths they were uh, there were so many uh, ukraine was their republican party uh, youth uh, wing was there so uh, so many youth uh, wings were there so they were fighting but now where do we find today's youth he is also having so many uh, you can say problems that though the time has passed the questions have not very uh, fundamentally changed still the issues are there the atrocities against dalit dalit women they are continuously uh, rising but why that uh, disturbance that questioning is not that uh, there in that uh, uh, severity in today's point i really feel that who is responsible that because if you re we are really 
uh, talking about Dalit Panther, then how do we uh, uh, can lead that spirit uh, next ahead? Because this whole debate will be there. What were the differences or who were responsible for that? Because we should also be very sympathetic to the, all that these uh, running any organization institution is not very uh, in a way very easy because these in all the youth. Minute. Sorry, okay. sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, because. Uh, because uh, to run an organization, you need this whole background of ideology or planning and all these resources. And the government were putting so many cases on this Dalit youth. So it's really becomes a, a tough to uh, run the organization. Individualism is there. We can't deny these uh, drawbacks among us because we are the product of this uh, social structure, uh, uh, socio political uh, structures in the society. So with all that, I feel we should take, we should be, we should look at after the, it is uh, 50 years to. Uh, uh, really how we can really revive that spirit to uh, better the situation or the, the, the today's uh, conditions uh, so uh, that's all i feel that uh, this five years history is very less but this is the, it's the power of that uh, um, moment dalit panthers that really the history can't be uh, uh, written off it has law has given lots to us Thank you once again for uh, giving me this opportunity to sh share my views. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Zadov. And it was uh, really um, important as to how you brought so many of the, um, again, limitations in, in terms of how the Dalit Panthers with themselves constituted some of the limitations of their politics, as well as some of the uh, necessities that still confront us today that had confronted the Dalit Panthers. Uh, during the 1960s and 70s as well um, so yeah that was a very uh, uh, wholesome sort of uh, assessment thank you so much for that so uh, now i'd like to invite uh, dr parthasarthi muthukarapan uh, sir please you can uh, begin your presentation uh, thank you angit thank you epw team for uh, this wonderful panel and uh, i'm really glad to be here uh, given there is so much of work on the historical and uh, you know uh, political significance of both Dalit Panthers uh, in the original Marathi context and also its uh, kind of similar formations uh, in the southern uh, states as well as other parts of the country. Uh, and, uh, and given the fact that I am not a trained historian or social scientist, uh, I thought I will do something different. Uh, these are very basic uh, preliminary and uh, tentative kind of thoughts on one of the radical texts produced by the movement. Uh, of course, there are many radical texts you can find in the literary world of Panthers. Uh, I am here talking about the Dalit Panthers Manifesto of uh, 1973. Uh, there is, uh, in a sense of uh, irreducibility to this particular text, uh, that is, uh, <clears throat> aesthetically, it resembles Ambedkar's annihilation of caste, uh, both in its structure and critique. Though there is a uh, there is a difference in terms of its arguments. <clears throat> uh, that it Panthers manifesto yields the possibility that it can be read not as a programmatic text but a political intellectual text that articulates a radical politics of future though there are enumerated programmatic pointers you may find in the text one two three etc etc i suggest that there is a subterranean thread that runs parallelly insisting on the irreducibility of the text to any short and programmatic action plan the significance of such a text today is that uh, this text was a ray of hope in a political darkness, uh, a vacuum created by Ambedkar's death, crisis in the Republican Party, uh, something close to what we confront today, some kind of political darkness. There is no light where to go. So in fact, one Marathi writer uh, puts this analogy of that situation where this when there's the emerge, uh, it's like a, a tribe of monkeys insanely fighting with each other to
to occupy the status of the chief uh, in the vacuum created by Ambedkar. So that's the kind of situation uh, from which we see this uh, movement. This particular text also foregrounds the need to have a critical understanding of what we confront a priori to transform the historical conditions. Uh, in a way, acts of interpreting interpretation of the world is necessarily constitutive of the acts of changing the world. It's a necessary correction to if you want uh, Marx thesis 11. This perhaps is indicative of the uh, irreducibility of the text to some programmatic action for revolution and uh, uh, quick uh, uh, action kind of a plan. So that is uh, about the irreducibility of the text to basically to ascertain its intellectual political characteristic by way of looking at the cracks within the text. The second one, uh, very often that uh, it's been told that uh, the movement is a, uh, on the one hand there is Buddhism, then Marxism, etc. But uh, perhaps I, I would uh, give a, I mean, I, I don't deny that fact, but still I, I would like to look at what did this uh, text yield. If one were to speculate the historical factors uh, that you have played the constitutive role in the formation of Dalit Panthers. Perhaps the prominent one seems to me uh, the uh, critical democratic public sphere nurtured and cultivated over a long period of time uh, by Ambedkar and Ambedkar's uh, movements through writing, collective reading. I hear from some friends that Ambedkar's journals are read in the villages people gathering and reading together. So this is a kind of practice. And also publishing activities, public meetings, and communal gatherings within Maharashtra. Uh, there is a, a vibrant vernacular, uh, uh, you know, critical democratic uh, public sphere created by the movement. Uh, unlike the intellectual uh, menu one comes across in case of for example, say Kolkata city, uh, which is known to have produced all those nationalist thinkers and all that, or even today you can say that a uh, city which produces most of the uh, post-colonial and subaltern kind of theoreticians uh, with the lacuna of not thinking about caste. Uh, Bombay city on the other hand, uh, seem to have uh, produced a very different set of uh, sensibility and certain kind of a hegemonic uh, political consciousness. Uh, to some extent, you can also say about Madras, they, you know, these are all uh, cities, prominent cities during the colonial times, and they experienced colonialism as viscerally as Calcutta. Still, they produce a different sensibility. Uh, Panthers are largely kind of, you know, uh, Bombay city is very significant to when there's uh, emergence, emergence. Uh, so th this is something that uh, uh, this sensibility is something that is not a simple consciousness that nationalist consciousness throughout his writings, Ambedkar calls it as the political, as against the social. But this is of a uh, so this is a consciousness which is uh, of what Ambedkar calls social, that is a clear critical understanding about colonial and the Brahmanic nexus. So this is very much present in the uh, uh, manifesto, that sense, uh, which manifesto treats 1947 not as the independent, real independence, but uh, transfer of power from uh, the colonial masters to the Brahmanic bourgeoisie or elites. So this is uh, something of a, with the fear of uh, that, you know, uh, multiple times this is more dangerous than on the British rule. So this fear, uh, you know, in, if you want, is expressed already in another manifesto in 1916, that is uh, from Madras, the non-Brahmin manifesto, which has proposed a similar take on colonialism. 
So this is to suggest that this is uh, clearly uh, located within the anti-caste uh, tradition uh, of thinking within the vernaculars. And there is certain uh, uh, revolutionary character to this text. Uh, of course, it's all about revolution. There is a manifest sense in which uh, the text is talking about uh, the inevitability and necessity of a revolution. Uh, but there are two senses in which one can actually uh, see the uh, what is the revolutionary thing about the text. Uh, in the manifest sense, of course, it is a text of revolution, a total revolution against the nexus between Brahmanism and capitalism, embodied in the governmental form that continues to subjugate and exploit the vulnerable. The text implies the absence of a true revolution in the case of Indian freedom movement that results in the passive revolution state pretends to transform the society with its five-year plans and periodical elections, etc. And the text detects that at the heart of this contractual setup lies the protection of the interests of the Brahmanical bourgeois class. That's why the revolution is the only possible way to overcome the paralyzing passive revolution state that serves the capitalism and Brahmanism. So that is implied in the text. So that's explicitly that's a, a call for a revolution. There is another sense in which you can say there is a, uh, this is a revolutionary text. Uh, the specific sense uh, by which uh, the text constitutes the subject of history. The that subject uh, that emerges in this text and also from much of literary texts that emerge in the Marathi uh, literary context is not a subject to be saved by some governmental policy or special measures like uh, the depressed, you know, uh, meant for the depressed classes or etc. Even you will find this in Ambedkar's late colonial discourse. But here is a subject which is quite uh, different. Uh, you may find in selectively in Ambedkar's writings, uh, one, one text I can think of is uh, Ambedkar's letter to Thakkar. Here is a subject that is leading the world and marching in history, both emancipating others along with emancipating herself towards promising future. Perhaps one can say that there was never a his in history any text witnessed such a historical Dalit subject before Panthers. It is revolutionary in that sense, it introduces Dalit not a subject being part of the history, subject to be emancipated in history, but as a history making subject. You know, it is the agentive of history, it is the subject which is actually going to transform history. Aesthetically, a text, this text overcomes uh, the paralyzing realist thinking of victimhood and vulnerability and produces a universalist agentive subject and universalist gesture. So in that way, this is another sense in which you can call it as a revolutionary text. So the next point, uh, how much time I have, Angit? Uh, so you have one more minute. One more minute. Yeah. Uh, so perhaps uh, one more thing that I want to say quickly is that uh, there is uh, the question about uh, you know, uh, repeatability and uh, whether this uh, movement is able to serve as a modular form for the repetition of similar movements, repetition of this at a different uh, context. Uh, perhaps that may be a wrong way of uh, posing a question. Uh, I think there is a different way by which one can think about that and those. That is to say that uh, I mean, given the context of the Indian uh, Federation Union of States with the different uh, linguistic, uh, for, linguistically formed states, uh, something that has uh, happened just not a uh, long time before the formation of uh, Panthers. Uh, so, so there is certain kind of a historically uh, produced uh, difficulty in terms of uh, thinking about uh, transformatory politics, even 
of Dalit politics across the country. So, given this uh, uh, huddle by this, uh, not having a common, uh, you know, language, and English is the only mediator language, which again is the, uh, you know, language of the bourgeoisie and the uh, dominant class, it is only within this vernacular this uh, revolutionary possibilities emerge. So, so what this has happened for other vernaculars is a certain kind of a distribution of the sensible, certain kind of, it's not uh, uh, clearly that uh, somebody is imitating this movement, but there are certain sensibilities which are uh, distributed across uh, other other places through translations and, uh, you know, uh, by recreations and translations. Uh, so it's certainly a kind of productive kind of a, a movement for uh, thinking about future and it's worth recalling it in the today's uh, moment of, you know, uh, political difficulty uh, to read again and again to see whether that can offer any uh, radical hope for our times. Uh, I will conclude by saying that thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Muthukarupan. I mean, uh, uh, there is so much to be discussed uh, about the Dalit Panthers manifesto itself. And I'm really glad that uh, you shed a lot of important critical light on some of the themes from within uh, the manifesto itself and, you know, uh, how, how it was received in uh, several other um, vernacular languages and so how, how, how some of its themes are still perhaps resonant in uh, today's times as well. So um, I'm sure we'll uh, get to discuss a lot more on other kinds of, you know, the lit literature that was the lit literature and poetry that was produced uh, during the period of the 60s and the 70s uh, in the Q&A. So I'll now move to uh, Soumya. Soumya, please, you can uh, start your presentation. Thank you, Ankit and Divya and Priyam, uh, and also Professor Guru for inviting me today. It's a pleasure and an honor to really share space with you all um, and to think about what the futurity uh, of and the Panthers and their philosophy is in their 50th anniversary. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the US side of things and how the transfer of ideas happens to Bombay. Uh, and, um, and I'm going to trace that specifically through the icons of the Panther itself, right? Um, so I'm going to get into it. Um, in the history of Dalit-Black relations, the formation of the Dalit Panther in 1972 features as an explosive moment of solidarity that re-articulated Black nationalist ideas of third world internationalism, land reform, and political revolution within the context of caste politics in Maharashtra. The political aesthetics of the Dalit Panthers attempted at attaching a positive even militantly rebellious political valence to the identity of being Dalit. As Anupama Rai writes in the caste question, and I quote, the term Dalit is both analytical and prescriptive. It defines the historical structures that experientially mark someone as Dalit and simultaneously identifies the Dalit as someone seeking to escape those same structures, end quote. Besides refashioning the naming of identity, the emergence of the Dalit Panthers offers historical grounds for comparing race and caste structurally with its associative logics. Recently, much of this discussion has occurred in the context of Isabel Wilkerson's book, Caste, The Origin of Our Discontents, that refers to caste as a universalized mode of social stratification that can be applied to the history of Dalits in India, Black people in the United States, and Jews in Nazi Germany. There are several historical and sociological inconsistencies in this conceptualization, which I unfortunately do not have the time to discuss in detail right now. But if we are to imagine a progressive transnational project like the Dalit Panthers, a theorization of an idea like, quote, global caste and its use of analogy as a foundation for conceiving solidarity across vastly different forms of inherited structural violence is insufficient. I divert from this approach of analyzing Dalit Black relations and instead adopt a translational methodology that accounts for ontological difference while paying attention to the aesthetic value of these transnational exchanges. A translational approach then predicates that we equally care for moments of untranslatability, 
which according to the critic Emily Apter, can become a way of seeing the cultural idioms that are self-resistant and withhold themselves from accepting capitalist multiculturalism's invitation to self-identify. In other words, I am challenging us to not think of solidarity and stasis as a condition that was achieved in its finality by the Dalit Panthers, but as discrepant engagement, as Nathaniel Mackey calls it, that pursues relationality through dissonance, difference, and openness. In that regard, I will firstly situate the Black Panther's agenda of Black internationalism, Pan-Africanism, and anti-colonial third-worldism with the Dalit Panther's efforts to carve a counter-public sphere in local politics. Secondly, I will elaborate on the issue of translation from a Black studies perspective, especially in relation to the migration of the Black diasporas and different chapters of the Black Panthers in the U.S. Lastly, I will illustrate the negotiations of solidarity by tracing the journey of the iconography of the Panthers from its initial sketching in Lowndes to its circulation in the Marathi Little magazines and its experiments in contemporary Dalit art. Unlike Martin Luther King, who found his way to India after embracing Gandhi and nonviolence, the American Black Panthers turned away from India to seek inspiration in more confrontational resistance to American imperialism in Cuba, China, and North Vietnam in the Cold War. Huey Newton, the leader of the Oakland chapter, famously said that his conversion was complete after reading the four volumes of Mao. Tackling issues of poor housing conditions, decreasing enrollment in schools, and an increase of police violence in Black neighborhoods, the Black Panthers frame their material struggle as an anti-colonial intervention against the negligence of a white supremacist state. It is perhaps their embrace of a communist materialist politics that determines the Dalit Panthers' allegiance with them against, quote, the hideous plot of American imperialism. Yet, the Panthers introduced a new political subjectivity, the Third World Dalit, and extended the definition of the Dalit to include the struggles of the Neo-Buddhist, working people, landless and poor peasants, and women. As Nico Sleep notes in Black Power Beyond Borders, simultaneously globalizing the Dalit and localizing the Third World, the Panthers arrived at a neologism that hybridized the concept of caste, state, ideology, and internationalisms. Even the idea of the third world is the creative appropriation coined by the French demographer Alfred Sauve in 1952 to compare the conditions of the third world to that of the third estate in France. The construction of the third world Dalit then reveals the many divergences in a long line of creative transnational translations. Since most of the third world, including India, had ignored the crisis of caste post-independence, the naming of the third world Dalit questions the integrity of the third world itself. Importantly, the aesthetics of the Black Panther Party was informed by their decision to present themselves as a diverse yet unified community of Southern diasporans who had arrived in great number after the end of the Second World War to places like Harlem and Oakland, California. As Donna Merch notes, and I quote, the intercommunalist nature of organizing the Black Panthers intentionally crafted a community-based organization that addressed the needs of the local population during a historical con conjuncture of internal displacement. If Brent Edwards, a Black, uh, a black a studies critic, frames translation as a model for tracking the transnational contours of avant-garde Black expression in the interwar period, its practice placed nationally in the context of the post-civil rights migration is helpful in seeing the Panthers' aesthetic as an effort at coalescing a separated, transient immigrant Black community. One can then also read the Dalit Panthers in this translational claim as participants of an ideational migration that radically refracted the politics of race consciousness through the prism of caste straddling the local with the global, anti-colonial with anti-caste, and left materialism with neo-Buddhist principles. So let us begin by tra uh, tracing the icon. And I have a couple of images that I would like to share. Uh, Ankit, could you confirm if my screen is being shared? Yes, I can see it. OK, yeah. great. Yeah. So let's begin by tracing the icon of the Panther at Lowndes, where the symbol of the Black Panther Party came out of an electoral necessity. 
Initially called the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, the Panther was selected as a party symbol by Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee members to contest in the primary elections against the Democratic Party, which was called the Roosters, by the way, after the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which outlawed the discriminatory voting practices adopted by the Southern states during the Civil War. Every political party was required to have a ballot symbol to meet the state requirements due to the high level of illiteracy in the area. The logo was the brainchild of Ruth Howard, a field secretary who was inspired by the mascot of Clark College in Atlanta, Georgia. Lisa Lyons and Dorothy Zellner would improvise on Howard, sketching in 1965 and 1968, respectively, for fundraising events for the Oakland Direct Action Committee and the Independent Socialist Club at Berkeley to demand the release of Cleaver and Newton. The Black Panther newspaper then, I apologize, I'm going with so much speed, but there's just a long historical you know, trajectory to trace here. The Black Panther newspaper, which was curated by their Ministry of Culture, Douglas Emery, shifted the production to offset printing, which gave the publication a more polished appearance and allowed the use of photographs and sophisticated graphics. Emery coined the term revolutionary art to define the paper's visual poetics as he invented much of the paper's iconography, which included the panther warriors with massive armaments, the grotesque police as pigs, which is visible in this cover as well, um, and the iconic Black Panther fist. By situating their intellectual struggles alongside their aesthetic production, the Black Panthers reveal the full scope of citing revolution as a meta text for their political and cultural activities. The icon of the Black Panther on the Dalit Panther Manifesto is identical to Ruth Howard's initial sketching for the LCFO. Yet the localization of the Panther's icon is most visible on the cover of Saptahit Manohar's February 1974 issue and the poster of Ubda Prakar and Ani Panthers, which was published to retaliate against the sexual assault of, Dalit, of a Dalit woman in Ubda Varda in Maharashtra a tragedy recalled by Raja Dhale in Sadhana magazine to justify the commemoration of the India's 25th Independence Day as Kala Svatantrita Divas. If we identify the form of the little magazine with the birth of global modernisms, the Dalit Panthers would start their own unperiodical circulation in magazines such as Atta, Rava, and Asmita Darsha to rebel against the soulful quality of Marathi literature. The icon of the Black Panther on the poster of Ubda Prakaran or the Saptahik Manohar epitomizes the importance of rage in mobilizing political action, especially when the passive state does not actively combat caste violence. Finally, I want to end by looking at the use of the Okay. Finally, I want to end by looking at the use of the Panther iconography by digital print artist and scholar Rahi Punya Shloka in his prints, The Panther is an Illusive Beast. As we see in these prints, Punya Shloka plays with the boundaries of the figure while retaining the central shape. And their haziness supposedly recalls the looming threat of the polluting shadows of Dalit people. I choose to end here because their granular surfaces evocatively illustrate the tension between resolution as digital clarity and resolution as that moment in a literary narrative when the central tension is resolved. Punya Shloka's decision to experiment with translucent borders is emblematic of the crisis of Dalit Black solidarity that I had mentioned earlier, in which it has never quite achieved its own apotheosis. But in the afterlife of the Dalit Panther's career gives us a theoretical and aesthetic means of reading race, caste, anti-blackness, and colorism through its own productive misalignments. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Soumya, for that uh, amazingly um, informed, both historically as well as theoretically informed um, presentation. I personally really liked looking at um, some of the images that you had shared. Um, uh, some of them I have I am seeing for the first time here. And uh, yeah, they were very, very enriching and um, 
puts us to think newly about some of the things that we already knew about um say the um contextual relations and inspirations of the dalit panthers from the black panther party in the us and so on and so forth i'm sure we'll have uh, more more uh, things to discuss in the q and a about the whole international context of dalit panthers itself and um, you know some of the themes within the dalit panthers manifesto for instance uh, you very nicely highlighted the issue of how to understand the word dalit itself so i remember there is that section in the dalit panthers manifesto titled dalits of the world where the word dalit itself is translated as the oppressed so you know taking the word from uh, taking the word outside its caste uh, sort of uh, uh, inflected domain to you know give it a more generic meaning i mean these are uh, absolutely fascinating fascinating uh, themes that we discussed uh, further yeah um thank you again and uh, i'd like to now invite uh, dr hugo gorinj uh, so you can begin speaking now. Great. Thanks so much, Ankit. And, and thanks to all the other speakers for, for setting the scene so nicely. And, you know, less thanks for making it a really hard act to follow. Um, like Somya, I'm interested in the aesthetics. So I'm going to share a, um, a presentation, but I, I haven't given as much attention to analyzing it as Somia has, it's more to relieve the tedium of having to look at me. Like Nirmala Jadav, I should also say that I'm no expert on the Maharashtrian Panthers. I'm here more to reflect on their wider legacies, to look down south at, you know, one of the enduring legacies of the Panthers and to reflect briefly on what their offshoot in Tamil Nadu has done and is doing. So you, you, can, you can see, you know, just on the slide there, the, 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 the lineages of, you know, mobilization from the Black Panthers to the Maharashtrian Panthers to the Panthers down south. And in fact, some of their imagery is even closer to the image of the Panther that the, the original Panthers had. And my own research has been on the Panthers down south. And in this talk, I want to do three things. First, I want to look at the legacy, the direct legacies of the Maharashtrian Panthers in Tamil Nadu. Second, I want to reflect on the ways in which movements um, are diffused around the world and across states. And finally, I want to consider some ongoing issues and debates that we can maybe return to in the discussion. So, first up, um, before moving on, I should also say that I'm a scholar of social movements, and I wanted to briefly introduce some of the theoretical insights of social movement theory here, and to point out that although most people study social movements because we believe that they create change, actually the scholarship on movements is fairly tedious because, you know, there's this big emphasis on the difficulty of, of pointing at causal Chains. The principal difficulty, as Guigny, one of the, the key scholars puts it, is how to establish a causal relationship between a series of events, blah, blah, blah. Movements do not emerge in a vacuum. As the speakers preceding me have shown, the Dalit Panthers themselves didn't emerge out of nothing. They built on the pre foregoing efforts of many other pioneers in Maharashtra, most obviously on Fule, Ambedkar, and Gaikwad. Um, on, on the Republican Party, um, but they also drew inspiration from those operating a world away in the United States. So, so movements never achieve things on their own. And so what I would like to, to suggest is that rather than talking about the success or, or failure of particular movements, we widen our gaze to look at the wider outcomes that they can achieve and to, to reflect on the ways in which mobilization helps to shape the societies in which we operate. Whilst much of the scholarship in the US focuses on political impacts, it's important to note that actually one of the biggest impacts of social movements is on the creation and facilitation of other movements. And so one of the biggest legacies of the Panthers 50 years ago is the still continuing party, the Vidudalai Sirtel Kachi or Liberation Panther Party led by Thirumar Valavan in Tamil Nadu. This was this chapter of the um, the Bharata Dalit Panthers was inaugurated in 1983 by Malay Chami, a, a, a legal scholar, 
on the invitation of Attavale. So, so there's a direct link, a direct opening of a branch of the movement in a different state. And for those who are interested in this history, I'd point you towards uh, the fantastic scholarship of my friend and colleague, Michael Collins, who has been writing about this in, in several places. And you can see the influence of the Dalit Panthers, not just in the fact that there was this direct link to, to past leaders, not just in the fact that key leaders, including Avon Kamble, Ramdas Atavale, SM Pradhan, um, you know, attended the, the opening of the party down south, but also in their ideology, in their key demands. You have the demand for the annihilation of caste and religion, for the destruction of the class structure, this recognition that it's not just casteism, but class, the inequality that's important, the emphasis on women's rights, on resistance to imperialism. But then, of course, we have the final demand, you know, represented by the five-point star, which is the promotion of Tamil nationalism. Indeed, the Dalit Panthers in Tamil became the India Odukapattar Panthers or oppressed Panthers. Um, so in a direct translation of the term, but very much a Tamil one. And immediately this gives us pause for thought. Does this mean that we're talking more about Tamil chauvinism and echo of the Shiv Sena rather than the revolutionary import of the um, Dalit Panthers? And what I would say here is that, and, and um, my friend Nate Roberts has pointed this out in his work on language and violence in the state, with the VCK, we're not talking about mere linguistic nationalism, you know, in exclusion of other, those who speak other languages. It has, the Rumar Alavan has written, to be a caste annihilating nationalism. It is not a nationalism built upon birth, but a nationalism built upon shared values, a nationalism built on a shared project of eliminating caste. The other point is that Dhruma and the VCK point out time and again that Tamil, protecting the Tamil language is not just about resisting Hindi imposition, it's not just about standing up to an English-speaking elite, is a recognition that Tamil medium schools in the state have become the preserve of Dalits and the poor. And so if we as Dalit parties do not emphasize mother tongues, then we are abandoning many to you know, continue in lower paying jobs. And so perhaps one of the criticisms of the original manifesto that the Panthers in the South have introduced is this emphasis on linguistic nationalism, but not in a chauvinistic sense, in a sense of, you know, empowering those at the foot of society. In this sense, Roberts argues, far from subordinating ambedkarite politics to Tamil, what Dhirumai is up to is refashioning Tamil nationalism as a form of ambedkarism. And this may be something that people will have a view on and may wish to return to in the chat. So, how else can we see the legacies of the Panthers down south? Well, one of the key ways in which movement spread is through tactical diffusion. And we saw that in the way in which the Dalit Panthers themselves adopted the tactics and the schemas of the Black Panthers. The use of Dalit is an obvious one, you know, inverting a label of stigma and taking pride in it. We are going to call ourselves what we are, oppressed, and fight on that basis. But you have other challenges as well. You have, following the example of those in Maharashtra, a direct challenge to casteism. You had people smashing up shops which served um, Dalits with separate tumblers. You have people walking down streets or cycling down streets as hitherto been denied to them. You had them demanding a share of common village resources and demanding a share of land. You had, as advocated by the Panthers in Maharashtra, a severe and sustained electoral boycott. And the poster up there, um, you know, basically says, um, because none of you are honest, none of you will have our votes. We, you know, we're, we're not going to vote for any of you. And the idea was that um, the, the Panthers went to the ballot boxes 
wrote this slogan on their balance, thereby spoiling it, and submitted them at that point. Finally, in terms of the legacies of activism, you have the emphasis on hitting back, the emphasis on returning a blow for a blow and for fighting back against caste discrimination where and when it happens. And all of this, I would argue, rather than talking about political change, although there was a big emphasis as the, the photo up there shows on Thirumavalun being in parliament, on the fact that the VCK now have two MPs and four MLAs, rather than thinking about the politics, I think we then need to think, well, what is the impact of this in terms of both cultural and cognitive change? And what I would say the VCK have done in Tamil Nadu is what the Panthers did in Maharashtra. They have empowered, or if that's too big a term in that many of the structures of inequality re remain in place, they have emboldened a generation of young Dalits. And in that process, they have allowed them to shift their horizons and to aspire to things that weren't accessible to a previous generation. And these aspirations have been fostered by the creation of tuition centers, by the use of slogans asserting the dignity and self-respect of Dalits, by the creation of networks of people who can provide recommendation letters, who can negotiate access to government jobs and colleges, and by the creation of people who are willing to speak up on your behalf. In this sense, too, the Panthers in both states altered the political agenda. They made it impossible any longer to ignore the issues being raised by Dalits. And several of the former speakers noted the way in which media attention has shifted. And that's just one of the indexes by which we can measure the outcomes of the Panthers. We see it more recently, of course, in the shifting focus of um, films coming out of Chennai, the way in which Dalit protagonists are now possible in a way which was unthinkable 20 years ago. Um, and my colleague Kartikeyan Damodaran and I have written on the ways in which caste cinema has been challenged and subverted by emerging directors like Paranjit and others who are offering alternate narratives which had previously not been able to be screened. And finally, Dave, the Panthers in both, both states inspired a new mobilization, a new wave of movements taking up the issue and pushing it in different directions. And the bottom poster on uh, the um, picture on, on the screen there is of the Purachi Puligal, um, an Arundadiya based movement in Tamil Nadu. And you can see how, you know, the, the, the same iconography, the similar um, layout, the similar emphasis on color schemes and so on and so forth is carried through from one movement to the next. So, you know, the issues raised by the Panthers are still inspiring people to take up and form new movements. But then this might lead us to question why new movements are needed if we have the Panthers still in existence. I wanted to close briefly with some more sort of critical reflections that it would be good to get into you know, greater detail in the discussion. And the issues and debates which I think require further discussion, and perhaps Gopal Guru can touch on these on the, in the discussion as well, are the issues of subcast unity. And the picture on the top of the slide there has Dhruma Valavan Paraya, you know, locating Dhruma Valavan within a caste category, even though he is always careful to refuse caste language and always refers to himself as Dalit or as marginalized rather than using caste terminology, you still have caste-based mobilization. And so the Panthers offered a blueprint for subcaste Dalit unity, which extended beyond caste and into class inequality. But that is something that's never been realized in practice. Likewise, as Nirmala noted, 
Gender equality is high on the agenda for the Panthers in rhetoric, and they speak very well and have articulated things both in public and in parliament around women's and trans rights, which are admirable, but there's less attention to the everyday inequalities which characterize casteism and patriarchy. And indeed, some of the ways in which the movement mobilizes, as I've written about elsewhere, using a rhetoric of honor and responsibility, recreates forms of patriarchy and inequality, which they are otherwise trying to escape. Finally, Dr. Oh, sorry, Gopinder, I... one more minute. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, it's, 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 academics can talk forever, so it's good to keep us on our toes. Um, so thirdly, you have the issue of land. So, so Dalit Panthers, like those in Maharashtra, have always emphasized the importance of land. To eradicate untouchability, the Panther Manifesto said, all the land will have to be redistributed. And this has been taken up by those down south, though, again, they've been less successful in actually reclaiming alienated land, the sort of panchami nilam, which was um, given to Dalits in the earlier part of last century. Two final issues on which I shall close. Um, the first is the issue of leadership, and the picture at the bottom of the slide there shows a way in which many of the Panther-inspired movements can end up being leader-centric um, and inspire you know, people trying to emulate their leader in looks and tone rather than ideology. Um, and so thinking about the creation of a community of leaders and, and how we do that. And finally, the issue of state cooptation and suppression. Um, we talk a lot about the way in which the Panthers disintegrated. A lot of that, of course, was due to state suppression. The re one of the reasons why the VCK entered political institutions was because of the number of preventative arrests that took place before any meeting. How can people unite and mobilize for land when activists like Stan Swami, like Anand Teltonde and countless others are being hounded and persecuted for doing what they do? Um, you know, so, so as Gopal Guru has written elsewhere, political immediacy dominates the cognitive map of Dalit politics, and it cannot be otherwise when the state is on their back. To conclude, the Panthers shook up the caste order, radicalized a generation, and altered the agenda. But the struggle is far from over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gorinch, for that uh, absolutely insightful, you know, sort of, uh, again, assessment of um, the Panthers that still survive today, and uh, we are very much witness to their uh, political developments and, uh, you know, also pointing towards some of the um, overarching concerns about the politics itself, which, of course, affects not only um, the operation of these parties, but also how we respond to um, impending issues like uh, state repression and, uh, you know, even perhaps uh, civil society disregard towards uh, many of it many of the activists um, that routinely get arrested and harassed um, and so on um, so now uh, i'd like to uh, invite uh, professor gopal guru the editor of epw uh, to offer some of his uh, reflections on the theme as well as to discuss um, uh, our presentations uh, sir are you here yeah i'm here yes as you can see me yes 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 <laughs> thank you very much ankit for uh, inviting me to make some comments Actually, I don't need to uh, make any special comments because you have you already done that job from time to time. You already made, made very pertinent observation on each of the uh, presentations. Since you have uh, invited me and since it is a EPW uh, webinar uh, organized by EPW, I must say something. Uh, I think there are uh, the participants who are very, very impatient to ask questions. So keeping that impatience in mind, I will really cut short and not make very elaborate uh, 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 observations. Uh, I liked all the five uh, presentations. Uh, uh, they are valuable in their own right. And, uh, and I would touch upon uh, them in a very collective manner, not in a very specific manner. The first point that we should really raise is that why do you want to really organize webinar on the Panther? It is, is it 
because it is completing 50 years or is there is there something very special about it or you want to actually uh, uh, re repeat the performance or repeat the pro re repeat the experiment of the lead panther and and actually partha has uh, hinted at that that do you want to use Palit Panther as a modular form to be available? Is it a classic case to be repeated time again, time and space? Is the question even you know Hugo Hugo's well, point also uh, is uh, about this? Is and it also has a bearing on this? So is it, is it a very classic case, case of uh, uh, organization which can be relevant across time and space? So this is the first question. And if it is, then on what grounds it, it has to be relevant? Uh, so this is uh, first point, and second point is uh, uh, how do you look at uh, Panther, the uh, Panther? Does it make uh, sense or does it remain relevant just because it has some resonance with the Black Panthers in America? Or as Somme has pointed out, does it really make sense in this particular point in time? because of its translatability, just because it is actually liberated from this very narrow contours of caste and become oppressed. I think uh, 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 if you want to really extend the context and make, make Dalit as a planetary concept, I think it will be uh, methodologically and perhaps epistemologically unfair to really put so much of burden on the, on the category of Dalit. Uh, it has to actually, you just can't take it uh, around the world the way you want to. And this is particularly for some man to think about it. Because there are scholars who are actually taking it around and giving it meaning the way they want to give it a meaning. But it's not the meaning that is there in the manifesto. And Partha has a very, very, very elaborate, very, uh, very, very uh, ably and, uh, and radically defined the text. So this is the second point. Uh, what is the uh, what are the conditions within which panther emerged and are those conditions actually uh, universally available and if they are not then i think it will be an ontological misfit uh, so that is one uh, concern that we have to actually raise the third point is, is uh, about uh, nirmala's presentation that you know we have we have to actually uh, invoke history histories that are very positive that are very inspiring they are very positive Affirm, uh, affirming your life your essence your self-respect okay you must really latch on to them hold on to them there's no problem about it but if, if if the history becomes a nostalgia a nostalgia becomes very very regressive and disenabling i think we should rethink about it uh, so panthers panthers history becomes very very enabling and positive in terms of its nostalgia which is positive then i think we can then I think the history of the Panther is available to some extent, but that uh, that again is uh, is an emotional requirement, is it not? I mean, you you want to actually become nostalgic about certain formation that took place in 1972 because of its uh, uh, you know uh, uh, moral economy, because of its radicalism, because of its spontaneity, because of its courage and everything. Is it available just because of this, uh, these, these, these very, very emo ethical, moral properties and values that Panther carried during that time? And what relation does it really have with the with with the dissemination, substantialization of ideas, which actually become substantialized because of the force of reason? So, how do you resolve this contradiction between emotion and reason? Is another point that we have to keep in mind. Uh, to, and, and I think uh, to, to my friend, actually myself and Uddhav, both of us were actually uh, close uh, uh, observers of Dalit Panther. And we have certain ontological link with this formation. So I thought and I, I would keep my emotions and experience out, out of the deliberation. Uh, but Uddhav was very, 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 very reasoned and very uh, under control. So he made a very, a very important narrative historical narrative of the Lit Panther. And his presentation is important because we have a very tattering history of uh, a memory of the Lit Panther. Uh, we are almost on the verge of forgetting the Lit Panther. And, uh, but there are, uh, there are works both in Marathi, uh, very insightful works are there. English works are also coming up. There are several works on uh, Panthers. And, but uh, tragically, the memory in the public 
consciousness is tattering, you know, it's really, it's not there, very, in a very concrete, vibrant form. And therefore, I think Buddha's presentation was absolutely so important. Finally, this pathos is a brilliant presentation. I think we should really think about uh, Panther because this, there is a manifesto. And manifesto, which is actually open up in, opening up into different radical directions, opening up with different possibilities. And we actually think about Panther not in terms of his politics and its emotions, but because of his theoretical background, which, which is there in the manifesto. And I think it is just like the many com communist manifesto. In the first line, as we discussed in the classroom, is a specter. The lit panther is a specter in the moment, in, in the manifesto. And that specter is articulable only in its, uh, in, in, in its normative form, which is there in, in, in the manifesto. And I think Parto has brilliantly brought it down. And his, his, his presentation is irreducibility of revolutionary text to program, pro programmatic. The real failure of the Lit Panther is because it actually sought very, very use, very, very studied deviation from the from the manifest from the norms of manifesto. Politics actually is the deviation. So what is there to emulate or follow? Politics are our text. And as Parthu has very rightly said, no, you have what is translatable across India, across regions in India and across India, across the globe not the politics, the governmentality, co-option, everything, not that, but the politics which is internal to this text. The force of actually changing the world, transcending the world with the help, with the, with the, with the force of the text, the normative force of the text. And that is what I think Parthos presentation is absolutely so important. I think I should stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Guru, for uh, your reflections on this theme. I mean, uh, again, there are so many issues that can be uh, discussed from uh, your own uh, 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 comments here as well. Uh, one thing that definitely comes to my mind, I'll, I'll just share that before uh, starting the Q&A, is this uh, comment made by this uh, Japanese Marxist philosopher Kojin Karatani, who had said that um, often literary renaissance comes at the back of political failures. And uh, I mean, if if not for those political failures, we can at least be thankful to the literary renaissance that you know the Lit Panthers inaugurated in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, and of course, we can we can discuss more about it later as well. So yeah, I mean, I'll start with the uh, questions and answers. I mean, in the interest of time, I'll, I'm very sorry I'll not I'll not be able to take all of the questions mentioned. There are a lot of questions there. I'll begin with the more pertinent and relevant questions to the theme of our uh, uh, webinar itself. So um, one question is there which uh, is asking any reflections on the meet in May 2022 in Nanded of uh, the members of the Black Panthers, Dalit Panthers and the VCK. I think the first ever uh, such you know physical um, meetup of uh, the Black Panthers and the Dalit Panthers anywhere. So um, I think uh, Uddhav, Uddhav Kamre sir would be a good um, um, candidate to perhaps uh, reflect on this question. Sir, are you there? Yes, Ankit. Uh, uh, please re repeat your question. Yes, yes, sir. Sir, in Nanded, uh, in the month of May, we had the meeting of uh, the Dalit Panthers and the Black Panthers for the first time uh, at the on the occasion of the 50 years of completion. So do you have any thoughts about that Nanded uh, conference between Black Panthers and Dalit Panthers? Uh, uh, I on, uh, please uh, uh, request the other panelists if they can replace. Okay. okay. Sorry, sorry uh, for that. But no, 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 no problem. No problem. Would anyone else like to answer this? Uh, uh, Dr. Gorin's VCK was also present there in that conference, maybe we would have something to say about that. Sure, I mean, I, I, so and I don't have a huge amount to say about it, but I think, and this reflects the fact that the Panthers from the very outset had this global outlook, that there was this sense of mobilization happening elsewhere. And of course, the situation that's different between the 70s and now is that communications infrastructure is such that there is more of a transfer of ideas. So rather than just seeing what's going on and echoing it, it's easier to meet up, to exchange ideas, to discuss things. Um, and, you know, all three 
of the outfits have emphasized resistance to imperialism, resistance to racism, resistance to forms of inequalities. And so, you know, this historic meeting makes so much sense. And it's different also to, to some of the other global meetings in that it is organized by, you know, from below. It is bringing people together to, sh to share an agenda. And I think it also comes on the back of the high point of Black Lives Matter mobilization in 2020, when, of course, there was an awakening in India saying, hang on a minute, where are all my Indian friends saying Dalit lives matter when similar atrocities occur here? And, and so bringing the two forces together can amplify the voice of both, I think. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much again. Uh, so Sunanda has uh, this question, and again, I think this is an open question. Everybody can answer. It is uh, that in even in the 21st century upper caste, people are afraid to take organs from, I mean, organs donated from Dalit people. Um, um, she mentions a newspaper report where um, a Dalit student donated his kid, uh, their their kidney, um, for some money, but uh, nobody was willing to, you know, accept that organ just because uh, they knew that it was donated by a Dalit. So, would anybody have anything to say about uh, the persistence of uh, such such kinds of uh, casteism even in the twenty first century here? Professor Guru, would you like to answer this? Yeah, but, but this is. Why? What bearing does it have on the manifesto of the Panther? Yeah, I mean, this is something which is uh, which happens, and uh, uh, casteism is a reality uh, in different forms. Technology doesn't solve the problem of uh, uh, casteism. Casteism is much deeper than technological reach, and so. Uh, what would have? What, do you really want the, some kind of organization to take note of this? If not the Red Panther, the uh, Red Panther had a different uh, 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 different issues to confront. I mean, atrocities was one, Bauda case and other cases in Chandrapur. So uh, we didn't have much time to discuss this, but uh, we, atrocities is it has become really uh, a matter of concern, and so we should we can make a general comment on this. Because the format of the discussion is something which is uh, uh, which is which demands why we discuss the Panther. The Panther's aim was to really end casteism and, uh, and 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 capitalism. That so so that should uh, I mean one can say that there is an answer in the Panther's manifesto to this question. That's it. About the Nanded thing, I think why I, why is this question so relevant here? Who is asking this question? What is the relevance of this? So you can always organize uh, uh, meet uh, and celebrate Panthers 50 years, no problem. But why, 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 why is some folks, somebody forcing us to say something on this? Uh, okay, now I'll uh, move on to the next question. So Shaurya is asking about. Um, this slogan that was raised uh, during the Naxalbari Andolan about uh, land to the tiller and how um, similar demands for land, redistrib uh, land redistribution were, you know, part of um, so many of the leftist, um, you know, um, politics as well. So um, he's asking this pertinent question, which uh, I mean gets repeated many a times. How do we think about the collaboration of left and Ambedkarite politics in in contemporary times? how do we think about the re reconciliation or uh, collaboration of caste struggle and class struggle um, and so on so um would um so um Uddhav, sir would you have anything to say to this especially since you highlighted how um the marxism buddhism um you know uh, difference was actually not the reason for why the dalit panthers uh, split which is taken to be the usual explanation for for their split so would you have anything to say about um, the engagement with the land? Yes, question? Ankit, the, the uh, yeah. as I think the Panther experiment itself was a synthesis of uh, casteism and uh, communism. Communists supported the Dalit Panthers, uh, no other organization, number one. Number two, uh, you see the manifesto and their sloganeering. Uh, Zati Vadiavar Halla Bol, Bandol Shaiver Halla Bol. I'm uh, sorry, I'm saying it in Malay. Uh, 
death to the casteism and death to the capitalism the panther itself panthers manifesto panthers slogan sloganering and whole efforts if you take from 72 to 74 it was some sort of caste and communism caste and communist ideas imperialism feudalism and uh, uh, other capitalism uh, they want to end the capitalism against they were against imperialism and at the same time they want to the end this was the starting point and this combination has uh, we have not gone forward that remain there and uh, unfortunately within a very short span of time on this ground on this issue there were differences uh, cropped up in the panther uh, uh, this was very unfortunate what i feel ki uh, the issues raised the artificial differences created in the name of buddhism versus communism uh, this was a very unfortunate thing there is uh, what i feel there should not be any antagonism and it, there should not be any adversity between buddhism and communism uh, and we can uh, try the efforts you see um, uh, i will give an example and caste and class need not be uh, the, the uh, contradictory to each other see the, uh, they can uh, uh, negotiate with each other and found find the way but the picture the, the picture is created the scenario is created ki they are incompatible what we have to see whether there is a compatibility between the caste and on this issue uh, differences uh, emerge in panther this uh, this itself i feel was the reason uh, an established class the power to be they exploited this to the fullest extent as i am mention in my uh, ex, uh, initial note uh, this issue was uh, highlighted this issue was magnified uh, dasal is dasal is propagating communism and dhale is propagating the buddhism actually this was not the case jv pawar in his article he has said the personal differences the egoistic personalities clash between the egos was the real reason of panthers split and division and not a buddhism and communism they can with our uh, present thing availability of the knowledge and we can uh, find a media via media and not they should not be treated as antagonistic and contradictory thank you thank you thank you so much uh, for that uh, response uh, sir uh, there is one question for uh, somya uh, where uh, the person is asking what are the hindrances of um uh, the contemporary condition of say the dalit panthers and what would you say are the alternatives both theoretically and practically and i mean if i can add something to this question uh, somya you also mentioned um, the recent book by isabel wilkerson on uh, a title cast and how uh, it you know gives a new sort of an intervention into thinking the whole race caste uh, equation or, or or problem that can that could also be traced back to how the dalit panthers approach this question so would you have anything to say about how um, you you know uh, uh, what 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 would you have to say about this whole race caste dynamic um, especially the theoretical dimensions uh, of it in today's times yeah i think i'll start with your question first and get because i think that's more relevant to what i spoke um about so the book is a, i always kind of want to start by saying the book is a journalistic book it's a book that is kind of covering large spans of time without necessarily making those distinctions so i sort of inherently disagree with the argument there in the way it is structured to look at caste simply structurally and i think previously professor guru had mentioned that if we are taking dalit around the world at what terms are we kind of leading that discussion right and um necessarily what is coming out increasingly is the sort of race caste paradigm uh what i think is reductive uh in engaging with this paradigm is to think about this uh, simply as a sort of like um 
simply uh, in terms of social stratification and see its kind of iterativeness across context and name it as such and name it as caste or name it within the fold of caste. What I'm more interested though is to think about how the etymological and historical roots of say caste from casta in Portuguese and how that kind of has its own circulation with um, Portuguese colonialism and how I think that is understanding the concept of Jati in South Asia, such sort of ideational and uh, conceptual transfers are allowing us to see, I think, systems of anti-Blackness, and I very specifically use anti-Blackness because uh, I associate that with a very specific kind of history of transatlantic slavery, uh, see that, I guess, uh, and it's, it, and uh, see see that particular history and its implications on thinking about other other systems that are kind of inherently organized according to associative logics. And again, I want to stress that I'm thinking about these logics associationally and not necessarily analogically, which is why I, I make that very deliberate decision to talk about it in translational terms, uh, because I'm, I'm not interested and I don't think that is a very productive activity to look for similarity everywhere. Uh, and to necessarily even think about such events that we mentioned, like the Nandir happening on those um, on those terms. Uh, instead, I think that there are historical, there are scriptural differences in how we are understanding these forms of stratification. But perhaps what is more interested in in the art when we kind of go back to the archive and look at them is how to see. Uh, how, how to look at these ideational processes and um, and and one of the reasons the Dalit Panthers is kind of important in this regard is because they is is because they react to this sort of uh, enmeshed history in very political terms uh, and they choose to associate themselves with one of the with perhaps the most kind of outwardly radical um, black expression in 20th century US, right? Uh, and I also kind of want to say that this is not only limited to how the Black Panthers is taken in the context of India, but various other communities, um, such as I think, you know, Ethiopian Jews in Israel itself, and those sort of very like complicated histories there that get illuminated and need to kind of get reconfigured through these rubrics of caste and colorism and anti-blackness, right? So um, I don't think this issue can I, can be kind of judged. The race caste paradigm can be thought of uh, as thinking through structures, but I think it should be thought through more through flows and I ideas, and also I guess the re and also to think about how these structures then get uh, transferred and how these structures then get co-opted in different ways. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Soumya, for that uh, extremely elaborate and uh, pertinent response. So there are two similar questions. I'll, I'll club them. And uh, uh, the, the, the question generally is how to assess the general direction of Dalit politics in contemporary India, especially with regards to an organization like the Bhim uh, Army, for example. Uh, and of course, that can be connected to something like the VCK as well. Um, so um, Dr. Gorinj and Dr. Um, uh, Muthu both, I think, can shed some light on these uh, questions. Can I say something about the previous question? Yes, sure, sure. Uh, I think I would think about uh, what just the uh, uh, previous speaker said and also uh, uh, complex are what he said about caste and class. Uh, I, th I think that's a very interesting comment uh, what uh, the previous speaker made about uh, Wilkerson's book and also in general about uh, how to think about race, caste, uh, dynamics, comparatively how do people do it, what is useful to do. So this is about this idea that I found it quite interesting. Uh, in the work of uh, Aniket Javre, uh, practicing caste, uh, about touch and untouch, uh, that, uh, in that book there is a one particular uh, interesting argument uh, emerges. Uh, that's, a, that's about uh, untouchability, stigma, caste kind of a phenomenon. He's suggesting that it is not, it is universal in a sense 
So it is not about uh, caste kind of practices existing in the American South or in Ethiopia or any other place, but rather he, he would suggest that this particular phenomenon is even existing among societies which are not necessarily practicing caste. It may be in a high, uh, European highly developed uh, modern class society where you may find this kind of a, a stigma and undisability. So as a universal problem is causing it, either I would say that. Uh, thank you. Dr. Gorinj, would you have anything to say about Bhim Army? Uh, very little to say about the Bhim Army, given that it's, it's up north and I do the south. But I, I guess what I would say about the Bhim Army and the, uh, uh, and the VCK is that there's always a cycle in social mobilization. And, you know, the Dalai Panthers emerge because you have this upsurge of restless youth who see the mismatch between the promises of the constitution and the practices that they experience on the ground. And in a wonderful article called Tactical Change in the Pace of Insurgency, Doug McAdam looks at changing tactics in the US civil rights movement. And, and what he suggests is that if we stick to doing the same thing time and again, we get nowhere. And, and you see that to some extent with the VCK, where they were institutionalized and therefore somewhat neutered, though they've discovered their voice again in an anti-Hindutva vein rather than necessarily an anti-caste vein. Um, and so the Beam Army is yet another expression of frustration amongst the youth who are, you know, seeing established politicians lose their radicalism and trying to in inject a new fervor into the struggle would be my reading. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, brief but cogent uh, response. I think I'll uh, convey this last question in the interest of time to uh, Dr. Zadho. Um, the question is simple. What was the role of Dalit women in Panthers activism? And again, if I may add something to that, what role um, about Dalit women does she see in contemporary Dalit politics as well? I mean, if that is something that Dr. Zadho could, you know, uh, shed some light on. Ma'am, are you there? Uh, seems sorry, can I put the yeah. question yeah. here? Yeah, she's there, she's there. So yes. yes, no problem. Um, so the qu uh, question is, uh, what what is the role of Dalit women Panthers activism? And I said, if I can uh, add something to that question, what is the role of Dalit women in contemporary Dalit politics itself? I mean, you, you do you have anything anything to uh, say about that? Uh, actually, as I said in my presentations, that the the the, the issue of atrocities and violence against women was a uh, key issue or the significant one. But the, uh, when we see the participation of women in Dalit Panthers as such, uh, very uh, almost one or two examples uh, would be there. I just forgot the name of those uh, women, and uh, even stated by the J. V. Power in his book. Uh, but no, that uh, significant participation of women uh, was uh, uh, there. And when we turn to the the part, uh, the role of women in uh, Dalit women in today's uh, politics is that, uh, yeah, the lot of uh, very significant criticism has been raised by Dalit feminists, and uh, they are talking about they are criti really criticizing uh, this Dalit uh, movements also. As uh, the Gopal Guru sir also said that we should be. Uh, uh, critical to these things uh, because uh, if we really become the, the uh, critical about this whole the positions and the, the languages of all these Delhi Panthers, it's really uh, in a way very disturbing to us that uh, really need of this. Uh, what you can say, the patriarchal uh, the, the views in my mind uh, is there. So it can be analyzed, but really, I, re I, I really felt it's uh, not to be very harsh, and I didn't mention those things, but it's there. And uh, uh, Dalit women are there in politics, actually, in the uh, Dalit movement, in, uh, in, uh, NGOs, and the uh, they can say literature, the poetry, they are there, but still as in the uh, in the politics, I feel uh, not very impressive stand of Dalit, uh, what you can say, as Dalit political activists or the leaders can be seen. 
thank you thank you so much uh, uh, dr zadho for um, that important response um i think uh, i'd like to end the q and a session here in the interest of time again and uh, uh, express my gratitude to all the speakers for you know um uh, uh, giving us this uh, extremely important and enriching um thoughts about um the not just the um you know nostalgic relevance of the 50 years of the dalit panthers but also some um hopeful hopeful strands of what we might um, look forward to in the future about about not just um, dalit politics but the politics of say um um even if i can say that the the the, the politics of the ideals enshrined in the constitution for example um uh these were extremely important um discussions uh, to be had and i'm sure we'll have um, more such discussions on other forums uh, as well again um um thank you to all the speakers to the audience and especially uh, a big um, thanks to um priyam uh, uh, member of the epw engage team for uh, you know handling all the technical aspects and for organizing um this conference i mean this 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 webinar and also uh, a big thanks to akanksha for making the lovely poster uh, that we had shared earlier um and of course uh, thanks so much to professor guru for his uh, gentle guidance uh, on 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 behalf of epw i'd like to thank everyone for joining this webinar again and uh, divya would you have anything to add um no i just uh, want to thank everyone for being here and thank you uh, the epw edit team as well as the engage team for organizing such a wonderful webinar yeah yeah thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you everyone uh, one you last appeal you. maybe if i can have the last word the last word should be that please subscribe to epw that would uh, be my last word yeah.